Welcome once again to my program, and it's called Roy Masters is Talking About You, and I think in just a few moments, if you'll bear with us, you'll see that it will be just like reading your mail. Everybody has the same basic problem. There's no such thing as anybody who is different. You know, only egos like to think that we're different. Um, you know, everybody likes to think they're different, but that's what makes them all alike. Have you ever seen women? Appearances only. Ego difference. I talk about different meaning different from the sinfulness and the sickness of the world. There are very few people like that. It's, as a certain uh, psychiatrist wrote, he's, it's a, uh, a book called uh, A Path Less, Less Traveled. I forget his name. Scott Peck, his name was, I think. Uh, it is a road less traveled. Hardly ever traveled. Narrow is the way, and few are those that find it. And this evening we're going to talk and hunt and peck and lift up stones and try to, to understand the secret of this pathway to being different in this truest, truest sense, this rarest way of being different. Okay? Now, I don't know where to start here this evening because I have said this evening is a free-for-all. You can, you can talk to me about anything you want. If it's dumb, I'll tell you to shut up. <laughs> don't think I'm rude, I just haven't got time to mess around with the type of questions that reporters ask President Reagan. Sometimes they're so lengthy and so complicated and so intellectual, I don't think they know what they said themselves. I don't know how the hell he answers them, but he manages, some, somehow, manages somehow being polite. I'm not going to be that polite, because I'm not running for president. So anybody have, have, have a question they'd like to pose me, or even a subject matter? You had a few moments ago, didn't you? Um, I hear you speaking about the negative roles that men and women play with each other. And I'm wondering what the proper role of a woman should be, because she often seems to be the downfall of a man. Well, if you played the proper role, you would not be the downfall of a man, right? Yes. And the trouble is, no man would have anything to do with you. Yes. <laughs> yes. You understand that, don't yes. you? Yes. I mean, the very fact that you're proper is is like a um, like a uh, like you're like you're like poison. They don't want you proper. They want to draw out of you that which isn't good. Now, but that which isn't good to a man is good to a man. See, because it's it's what he's made of. So you, we're talking about the pride of men, aren't we? The animal pride, the selfishness of man. The earthiness. Well, that earthiness lives out of what is not proper in a woman. And uh, the, the woman that's not proper is very exciting to such a man. And the woman who is proper is not very exciting to a man, <laughs> see? So that's your problem. If you're going to be proper, there aren't many men that won't have anything to do with you. It's going to be lonely. <laughs> well, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think so. Not if, you, if you're proper, you're not lonely. Because you are complete. Or you know that your completion is from within you and it doesn't from a man or from anybody else. Mm. I think if you have found a proper man, he, as he is taught himself, as he discovers for himself the way, he will teach you the way. He will lead you back to being whole from within you. Being a person that doesn't sort of flow from him because he's not a person that flows from you. See, you don't flow into, in and out of him and he doesn't flow in and out of you as a way of developing this identity. The identity is within and complete. And to the degree that somebody loves you, to that degree, they won't, won't flow into you. And, and they won't let you flow into them. They won't, won't let you bond. I won't let my children bond. I'm not very affectionate to my children. Well, not since they were four or three or four, two or three. Once they got to three or four, I didn't need to be affectionate because, well, like Joshua, my grandson, says when his mother wants to be affectionate to him, he says, give it to Jennifer. She needs it more. <laughs> she needs that love. <laughs> See? I remember my mo mother used to want to dance with me when we go to a wedding. I felt terribly embarrassed, but she felt, oh, she felt this is my son flowing into him. And See what I mean? She felt very proud. And I felt like, yucky, that's something she wanted to take something from me. 
Gentlemen, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? And I tell you, the person who is going on the path less traveled uh, is very aloof. Not ice cold. It would seem from, from people who can use your, uh, your imperfection to, to, to draw from that you're a person that is not any use to them. They can't use you because you're not a person to use others, so therefore you, you can only use a person who uses you. You can only flow into a person who flowing into you, <laughs> you see what I mean? <laughs> you, see, you can only get into a person who's somehow into you. And you often make that opportunity uh, available. Like women have this, make this opportunity of men to flow into them and get into the woman, but she gets into him. You know, you can take the boy out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the boy once that happens. That's an identity problem. So men have identity in women, and, the, and once the woman's identity is into the man, then it is impossible for a man to be anything but what the, what the woman is. He's made of what the woman... Is. In other words, it's corruption. Pride, the pride of life, the identity that comes from the world around us, the appeal, the glorifying appeal, like a woman is a glorifying appeal. Oh, I'll make you a million dollars as a, a glorifying appeal. I'll make you a film star as a glorifying appeal. Someone loving you and giving you all the approval. Someone giving you a gift is a glory. Once you start to come down to that love, to that flow, that offering, once you start to bite that, you can't let go of it. You can't be anything more than your involvement with the object more involvement with the object, if you see what I mean. And that's the man-woman relationship, yes. You made that sound kind of final, that uh, once the spirit of woman got into man, that you made it sound like it was almost irreversible, but it, I don't believe that. No, I didn't, didn't mean to imply that it's in, irreversible, but you can't reverse it. No, I can't reverse it. No, you can't. In other words, you, you are the product of your environment, just like the, the dope addict is a product of the dope pusher. And he cannot be any more than what the pusher makes him. And what he makes the pusher, what, what power he gives to the pusher to make him. It's like men give, men give women power to give them illusions of grandeur, give them a sense of who they are. They give men, they give the women that power. So does the dope addict give the power to the pusher to see. Once you recognize this in yourself, though, isn't that the, the first step in the right direction? Yes, but what is it in a person? There's a lot of people listening to this program right now who um, have the foggiest idea what we're talking about. There's no other dimension. For, for, there's, nothing, there's nothing more than, than the, the creation of the creator. See, there's the creation of the creator, the inner man directly bre inbreathed from, from God that holds man apart from life, that can hold him up, and make him aware that there's something wrong with the way he exists. But the great majority of human beings, if you can call them that, actually are not really human beings. They only appear to be on the surface. They are so much the creatures of the creation, the beast. There's so much the reflection of that which lurks in the environment, sort of hovers in the environment. So full of that are they, that their very, their, their, very, their very infrastructure is tremendously threatened by us even talking about this. So if you're capable of hearing what I'm saying, it's because you are chosen. Not everybody is able to hear the truth because, and I don't know the mystery of it. I don't know why I would, you or me would be able to hear what I'm saying enough to be able to go to where I'm coming from, and to grow from where I'm coming from, like I'm growing from where I'm coming from. See, I don't know what the mystery is, but some, there was an article in the paper um, this evening someone gave me, he said there's, there's a certain type of child, about one in 10, that no matter what environment they've come from, the horrors of, of brutality and alcoholism and rape and violence, somehow they're resilient to all the stresses, they slow to anger and quick to recover that nothing seems to touch them. Like Oliver Twist, remember the story of Oliver Twist? No matter what he went through, such a beautiful story, 
everybody else was violated and corrupted and they became thieves and low-life types of human beings, but little Oliver Twist kept his dignity throughout it all, so finally he could be recognized by who his parents and who his relatives really were. It's a lovely story. And, and, and it's the same with you, ladies and gentlemen. There's something in you that holds you, it holds you apart to some degree. Of course, you are involved with them, and them are in you, and you are part of them. And that's the reason why you have conflict. But you have conflict and they don't. They don't have the kind of conflict you do. And therefore, they don't have the ultimate possibility of resolution like you do. See? So you become the, uh, the, the perfect person. They I become... The, uh? I read the Adam and Eve syndrome. Yeah. And, you know, it was very threatening to my ego. Of course it is. Uh, <laughs> You're talking about this book painful. here, right? I was talking about yeah. that book. It was very painful, you know, but I, I sit through it, I read through it, and I learned something from it. What did you learn? Just that, what we were talking about. That I man? learned that, that uh, the spirit of woman in me controlled me for, for a lot of years. And it brings you back to woman and for the source of your life, doesn't it? That's right. The renewing of your life. I'm starting to overcome that, though. Oh, how so? I don't know. You don't know, huh? I don't know. You never. <clears throat> first of all, you have to realize it. Right. Just then the realization patient. leads to overcoming. Now the gentleman over there. Oh no, that was when I was much older. Oh, I thought when you I said. When I was sixteen, no, no. Oh, I thought. Well, let's say. Well, let's take an age. I thought you said four or five. Let's say it's sixteen, and <clears throat> you danced with her, or you played a game of checkers with her. That's not. Your mother doesn't love you or show love? Or I, don't that, she sh I don't know what you're saying. Is so she showing too much love? You said your mother shouldn't show too much love to, uh, or you shouldn't no, have we too much love. No, we were talking about, see, this is sort of a little bit, little bit uh, belated, so there's yeah. a lot of pieces missing for most of the audience. Oh, I see. We were talking about um, affection. Affection. And mothers like to shower their sons with affection. And it's the duty of fathers to separate them from their... See, fathers should be more dispassionate especially as they grow older, as men get wiser, they should become more dispassionate. They should love their wives, but almost love them like their children. Now, the women livers will hate every word I'm saying. But if, 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 a, if, if a woman, if a man doesn't lo love her, his wife like his son, like his daughter, the woman's going to love the man like a son and keep him a little child through her emotional support and her, and her passion. And that's the, the embarrassment you feel when your mother asks you to dance in a, in, a, in a wedding or something. If you're not centered in yourself to know how to deal with the pride that mother has in her son and the feelings that flow, the warmth and the feelings that she gets from that. This is my son. See, the feeling that mother... Who knows what I'm talking about? You do? See, so... So I think you missed the point that I was making, that men, as they grow, men to really be a man is uh, dispassionate. Now, that doesn't mean to say a man has no emotion. This is probably coming back to our questions, uh, a subject of man and woman again. That doesn't mean to say a man does not feel anything, but he, doesn't, he learns not to feel from the woman's presence. A woman likes to make a man feel from her presence because then she becomes the center of his being because then he starts to exist from that. And this is what's embarrassing to a child, when a young man, when he, with his mother, wants to dance with her, and, you know, she, there's a certain embarrassment. And it's, well, you're either bought into it, you've either bought into it and you're, not, you're, not, you're a Neanderthal and you don't understand what's going on, or you're in, totally in control of yourself. You're beyond it, and you're gracious with your mother. In other words, you, you, you're, not, you're, not buying the, you're not playing the game, you're beyond it. As for example, let me give you an example. Let somebody meet you at the airport. Hello, I haven't seen you for such a long time. They put, they put their arms around you. They make such a big display, hoping for you to interact because they feed off of that. So what you, you've got to be very mature after how to deal with it. So you, 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 it's, it, the, the only reaction to that is either to be react with the same kind of greeting, emotions, and you, then you are bonded to each other right away, and you g give that person the feeling they want, which isn't good. Or 
you have to reject them, which you can't do, and still be friends. It's a very delicate moment of learning to be gracious. Hello, nice to see you. A smile, a French, but no, no reciprocal emotion. Because otherwise you lose control. Anything that can make you feel, anything can emote feelings, see, takes, a, takes you away from yourself. The love of God has nothing to do with the emotional feelings, the, the interpersonal emotional feelings that people have with each other. It's transcendent to that. Hello, I'm Roy Masters, and we are discussing the human ego, the human condition, and all the problems that unroll from it, and how we can overcome this evolution of error between one another, me reacting to you, you reacting to me, I get upset with you, you get upset with me, I get upset with your upset, you get upset with us, I'm upset. We presume we're killing each other, driving each other nuts. This is what we're discussing. And, and the, the problems of man's relationship with man and woman have little turnings, little like, for instance, we, last evening we were talking about, or the last session, we were talking about giving and receiving. That's a problem for people, to know how to give, to know how to be kind, Sometimes we, we can't give at all because we've been, our, our experience is we've been hurt by those we've given to. Some people in our lives have actually manipulated us to give. Or we've man manipulated others to give us because we've made them feel sorry for us. And having made them feel sorry for us, we find an easy way of getting things without having to work, just becoming pathetic. See? <laughs> So therefore, those who, give it, those who give to us, we have contempt for. Because even one, though, in one, one sense, we like it. We feel s smug and superior, clever. And on the other hand, we discover that we're no longer dependent on ourselves. That we're really dependent on manipulating. And we can't get anything for ourselves except we sort of take it from others. And that, so therefore, we tend to blame those other people that we've manipulated to give us for being so weak and not seeing what we really need. Someone to say, no, I'm not going to give you a thing. Go get it for yourself. But then the liberals would cry out, but that's cruel. See? And you see a whole society of welfare recipients being given things and then robbed of their identity. And so, of course, there's a whole panorama of problems without me... I don't have to say really much more than that. You can see what problems we have in our society from parents spoiling children, government spoiling um, the, the population, and the angers and the hatreds of, on both sides. While the, the, those who receive it are, are dependent and, and, and resentful because they, can't, they don't have, they're locked into that lifestyle without being able to grow and evolve from their own roots, having been robbed by the kindliness of the liberal politicians. The liberal conservatives, you know, liberal with your money, conservative with their own. Right? So, you see, we've been talking about... You still want to talk about that? Because there's kindness, and then there's guilt, and then there's fear, and then there's resentment, and then there's judgment. There's all kinds of little, little um, pinpoint frames of reference that le lead back to or grow from the original problem we have. See, and so that's what we're gonna, so we're, this evening we're on a roll, I think, on, on, on giving. I don't mind if you wanna change the subject and go from one thing to another. Yes, that lady back there. Why is it that when you, uh, when you receive a gift from someone, sometimes you feel awkward? Like if you, if you don't like feel you've earned it, then you feel awkward about receiving it? I, I'm guilty of that. I have to tell you, I have a ranch in Oregon where I was too kind to people that came in out of the rain, out of the, out of the cities, and I didn't let them work as hard as they should. And they became smug, spoiled, um, comfortable, dependent, and didn't grow. My daughter has a wildlife park. She does the same thing. She, um, out of an agreement with a certain person who lent her some money, agreed to take girls in and, and 
shelter them and teach them a trade and give them money, you know, let them earn a, earn a salary and uh, use their time properly, save their money, but she works their tails off. She works them hard and doesn't pay them much to begin with, but they turn out better. When you pay a person too much, I've had a person here who was on drugs. He actually worked for me, very intelligent fellow, 50 bucks an hour he used to earn, some super electronic technician technocrat. And uh, while well, he was on cocaine, well, he, he felt guilty for receiving 50 bucks an hour. Besides, he could do the work in half the time anyway and sit around feeling guilty for not, he was being paid too much. Um, but in time, I want someone, if, in, the mafia does that, or big business, they will take a person of very ordinary persuasion and they'll pay them $200,000 a year and seduce them into the soft life. Once you get that feeling of being a king, you'll kill for it, to hold on to it. You see that? But why do you feel awkward? Why do you feel awkward? When people give you things? Mm -hmm. Because mostly it's not given in the right spirit. Mm -hmm. yeah. One. Two, you don't know how to receive it in the right spirit. For instance, I have people giving me things. I, know, I don't get many personal gifts. That's, that's, uh, that's the truth. I, I, I make it a point of uh, reminding people, letting people know I'm not interested in a personal relationship with anyone. If they want to give, I'd rather not know you gave it. Just give it to the foundation. Thank you very much, and I don't want to know who you are. And it's better that you don't know that I... I mean, some people try to let, you know, put money in my hand to let them know who gave it because they want a certain amount of honor, see, from that, and I don't give honor. I'm not a respecter of persons, and, and, and it's because those people especially shouldn't be receiving that, that smile because they're giving for the wrong reason. They're getting to get a reaction from me, an appreciation from me. It's not healthy. But um, people who have occasionally given me things um, uh, with an ulterior motive, um, I've been able to learn how to deal with that because, for example, let's take, go back to the flower at the airport, the little flower that the Hare Krishnas give you. Well, if they're going to give you a flower, how do you handle that? Because you know that you, they're going to hit you up for some bucks, right? To sell you something. So the first thing I'll say is, do I owe you anything for this? Do I have to buy anything before you give it to me? Oh, no, not at all. But they're lying, aren't they? So I said, if that case, you can put it on. She said, now they start talking to me about this book. I said, okay, but you remember what I said? You gave me the flower, and I wasn't obligated. Now, if I say no to you, how will you feel? Well, she said, you don't have to. You don't have to. But they keep on pushing. I said, you're pushing. Mm -hmm. I said, you really want me to buy that book, don't you? And you really resent me if I don't buy it, because you lied just now. You really, you lied. <laughs> See? And See, you must put it right back on. That's one way. So when people give you a gift, make sure that if you send something fishy, say to them something like that, politely, uh, this is very nice, thank you very much. Um, am I obligated to give you anything for this? <laughs> now, they can lie and say, oh, no, but they really mean yes. Yeah. But finish with it. Now, six weeks later, they come to come to get that favor that, you know, you owe them. In their mind, you owe them. They're not honest. And you say, no, I, I can't do that. You might want to do it if it is natural for you to do it, if it's not out of your way and you don't mind. But when you start to feel the pressure, so do you remember what you said? You gave me that gift the other day? Is, am, am, am I, is this a payback? Am I obligated? Oh, no, not at all. But they really don't mean that at all. They really mean it. Do you understand that? And you, can, you, you show people, you start to throw people back on themselves and show them what their motive is. And they can be very resentful and very angry with you. See? And then you could also find out of that, that out of their anger, they try harder to be nice to you. They can literally become your slave. Because they didn't get you once, they'll try again. They try to prove to you that they didn't give you anything to get something for you. They try to prove it to you. Because now, but you're not having that either. <laughs> and you find that everything starts to go well for you in life because people will start being nice to you and you don't even know why. <laughs> yes, <laughs> who understood what I just said?
Yes, I do have a question relating to giving. And you, you said earlier that we need to give out of the goodness of our heart. What does that mean? Where is it? You know, Where's the heart? It's, it's, it's in here somewhere. It's very difficult. I used to give me very mechanical, you know, 10%. And then I thought, I realized that was wrong. Then we would give it work because it was politically necessary and you got pressured to do it. So I rebelled against that. What I'm doing now is that I feel comfortable giving if I can get something kind of like a little benefit of return. Like I have no trouble giving or subscribing to your magazine. I'm getting a magazine that's going to a good cause. The same thing about your ranch experience. You know, it's going to a good cause, but it's also I'm getting something in return. Right. And it's that area where you want to give freely out of the goodness of your heart that I'm finding difficult to find. In other words, for the most part in your life, you've never really given out of your goodness of your heart. That's correct. You've given out of some kind of pressure, some kind of guilt, something, some out of, some out of fear, out of a need for approval. Something like that, right? Exactly. You give to get. Right. And, and, and that's uh, the only kind of giving you've ever known. Right. And it's not easy. It's not easy to make the transition. And that's what the reason why the foundation has been such a long time, such a long time in growing. Because I will not, you know, use the used car salespeople tactics. I will not use those preacher tactics, the, the Jimmy Baker tactics, and you know, all, those, all those pressure techniques to, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to jump off this t tower if you don't give me five million dollars. And it'll be your fault if I die. So we don't want to be guilty, so we give. I mean, that's dangerous, you know. If you see people commit suicide or, or lovers quarrels where, you know, if you don't love me and marry me, I'm going to jump off the em Empire State Building. Well, the, the way I deal with that is go ahead and jump off the Empire State Building. I don't, I'll get rid of you that way. You, you know, you, you know, once you start giving into that, you you're always responsible. And then you start to feel guilty because you can feel guilty for, for buying into that. See, there's, it's the wrong reason for giving. And anytime you do, everything that's not of faith is sin. Every time you're motivated to give, it, you're, you're really giving out of, for the wrong reasons and from wrong motivations. And that cannot serve God. It cannot serve the person you give to because once he discovers that works, he's going to try it on you again. See? He's going to make you responsible for saving that person. That's a, that's a fate worse than death. So you just can't give in to that, and the person jumps off, uh, off the, out of the window, then, well, they don't have to do it. That's all I... But when, once they see that you're not, you're not emotionally involved with that, it's a relief to them. But once they see that you are emotionally involved with them, it disturbs them d deeply. Because each time they get closer to carrying out the threat. See? And each time they, they get their own way, they get what they want, which isn't good for them. And they're addicted to that method of getting what they want. Threatening, threatening, threatening. So, there's a right way of giving and a wrong way of giving, and the Foundation has waited 27 years to get the small number of people that support us. That's, we'll wait years. Some people listen to my program for 10 years. I've had people say to me, well, I've, a couple of times I had $25, to, and I actually had the postal money order in my hand, and then I cashed it in and, and, and bought, bought something for myself. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and we don't pass a plate around. Did anybody get asked for money when you came in? There's a don donation box there, right? Does anybody say, <coughs> did we? No one did that, did they? You don't hear me begging. I just give of myself, and I hope to, to, by giving of myself, bring you to yourself. And when you come to yourself, you'll see I have needs too. If only to supply you with m some more understanding, if only for that, that's okay too. But later on, when you don't need me anymore, there are people who write to me from Saudi Arabia. And you can't even hear my programs, 300 a month, every month comes in regularly. I never, sen never send them a thank you note. Why? Why should I thank them for thanking me, for thanking them, for thanking me? Why go backwards and forwards? It'd have to drive you nuts. <laughs> you know? And they don't understand that. And that's all the more reason why, you know, if they're looking for that thanks and they don't get it, then maybe the, the, the checks stop. 
Well, it's only because they're looking for thanks. It should be out of the goodness of the heart. It's a good cause. I'm helping people. They got help. Yeah. Make sure the secretary sends so much every month. And that's the way it should be. Apple gives apples give apple trees give apples, and they don't think anything of it. How does she get goodness in her heart? Ah, well, that's what this whole program is about, isn't it? That's we, we, we're just beginning to understand the wrong reasons for giving. Now, let me just make it lead, lead closer to that question. The question is, don't give anything to anybody. If you feel pressure to give, do not give. That's the time. When you feel this pressure in the solar plexus here, because your brain somehow, the brain doesn't feel, but you feel what's going on in the brain somehow here. I don't know why. But you know that you're, you're, you're being motivated. Or someone's got one of your buttons or nerve endings that's from some ancient conditioning. And you may not understand it. Do not give. That man comes to the door, wants to give you to give to the crippled children's foundation, and you feel the pressure, and you're not as dignified as I just mentioned, as, as you might have been. Just don't give. Say, I'm not giving. Thank you. You can always change your mind. The, the, the moment can pass, so you can always call them up. Or a week later, a month later, you can send them a check, right? Don't give. Don't give under pressure. Well, all the pressure's passed. Well, it's passed. Don't resent the pressure. If you resent the pressure, you start to feel guilty. And then you start to give, you start to feel like you did something wrong. Anytime people pressure you and you resent it, it is natural or unnatural, as the case may be, to feel like you did something wrong. You did. You resented them. Now, when you, when you're now, but you don't understand that, you feel like you've, you've done something wrong. They did something wrong to you. You reacted without love. Now you feel like you did something wrong and you have to make up to that. Now you give. Now you give to make up for the guilt. As if that would make it right. It doesn't. is that I know that it will be a blessing for me to give. And yet my head does a little number say, well, you didn't give, you won't be blessed today for sure. Well, see, that's the old conditioning. It, it, it's just a you little don't give to, You don't head. give for a blessing. No, because then you're giving for the wrong motivation. So it's, it's, it's like a stalemate. It's like a little uh, yeah, you're giving. tug of war in See, my in other head. words, just say those things again about, about the... Uh, the um, what you just said just now, I can't remember. Re re rewind it and spit it out yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's, it's like, if I just feel like I want to give something because I know the, sp the, the spiritual principle is there that you are blessed when you give for the right no, reason. No, no, no. You mustn't give for the spiritual principle. Exactly. You mustn't give. I had a guy, I had a person who worked for me for a while and he listened. I don't think he listened very closely. One day, I mean, he didn't have very much money. I, I had to lend him something. I forget what it was, but he went to San Diego to listen to that woman. What's the name of that lady that used to? Terry Cole yeah, Cole, Terry Cole Whittaker. And uh, when he came back, he was broke. And I said, why are you broke? He said, well, I had $300 and I gave it to the church. I said, well, for? She says, well, if you, if you give this money, God's going to give it back to you tenfold. So I figured, well, if that's the case, I'm going to give $300. I get $3,000 back. He never did get it back. He still owes me $300. <laughs> you know, so the point is, he's the idiot. This idiot thinks it's given for the wrong reason. He's given $3,000. A lot of people, I, I can't believe that people actually do that. Have you ever done it? Sure. Yeah, but it's, it's dumb, isn't it? That's the wrong reason. Selfishness. They, they trap you into giving. You're never going to get your money back. Or maybe some people do. I mean, just pure luck or something. Or whatever. And they, use, they hold this up as the, as, the, as the model, you know what I mean? And the testimony. Well, I gave the Lord $300, and now I've got $3 million. And I, they got this little... It's, it's not, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't work. You don't give because you're going to get a blessing, and you don't give to avoid a cursing. You just give, like an apple tree gives apples, because you see that it's appropriate. And then you think nothing of it. See what I mean? <laughs> I, I you don't think, think of the rewards and you don't, there's no strings attached? I think it's a head trip that goes on in my head where my mind tells where me that's what from? I'm doing. Where did it come from? 
Well, Did you belong to the Catholic Church or something? Uh, no, Seventh-day Adventist and then a bunch of religious. You got all that religious, you got all, you got all this religious mumbo-jumbo. Right. They laid head trips and guilt trips on you and you've been doing it ever since. But I tell you, do you give like that? You're guilty for giving. And then you don't like to admit you're wrong. And what do you do? You give more. It's the same thing with uh, anything. Like a woman loves a man. She gives of herself. All right? What does she give? She gives to get. You see? But let's say, she, let's say the man takes advantage of it and he doesn't give back. Doesn't love back. She starts to resent it. Now she starts to resent it because she gave. After all, if you give freely, there is no resentment. Is there? If you gave with no, no ulterior motives, if you give with love, if, you, if, if a woman can give her body to a man that loves her, there's no problem because she doesn't expect anything back and he doesn't expect to give anything back, but he does anyway because he loves her, <laughs> not because there's, there's a string pulling. So, so therefore the woman gives to get back love and she doesn't get back as much love or the love or the quality of love that she anticipated. So she now secretly resents him. And this resentment makes him even more guilty. But how does she get rid of the guilt? Well, she gives of herself even more, hoping to get something back, take away the pain of her guilt for loving. But she's, but she's loving, she's giving for the wrong reason. She's guilty for giving, because she's guilty of giving to get. And the, and the evidence of this is frustration when you don't. Hate. And a compulsion to give more, to get. And more, like a gambler. That's right. It's just like a gambler. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Ten years ago, uh, with your meditation, I began to improve in a lot of ways. And I don't know how to exactly say this. My sex drive seemed to change. They get less? Yeah. So I thought, to heck with this. I'm not going to lose that. Oh. Um. <laughs> well. You don't know what a mistake you made. Tell me about it. <laughs> so I decided to cure that by not meditating anymore. Ah. <laughs> That'll cure so, it. <laughs> that was followed by 10 years of pure hell. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so you finally bad. learned that I was right. Very evil. <laughs> well, fine. So I begin to meditate again. Yes. And some of the evils begin to drop away or diminish. And yeah. I told you two or three weeks ago, even the smoking. Now you can guess what else is starting to diminish. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting worried again that I seem to be following the same path. I'm not drinking. The smoking is falling away. It's not gone, but it's going away. Yes. Some for some reason, I don't know why. The sex drive is changing, and and I'm getting that. You should be happy. I, but, but I'm mad at you because I feel that I know this is in, insanity. I got broad shoulders. I but I feel like you're taking something away from me, like the like doctor life, that took like out life. part of my throat. I, he had to do that because there was something in there that had to be removed. Yeah. But I'm mad at him, like he did something bad to me, which is insane. Well, this is just as insane. I feel like I'm, you're taking something, like you are taking <coughs> something away from me. And I'm afraid that I don't want to stop meditating. I don't want to go that But I'm also introducing something better. I'm, I'm taking something which is the, root of, is the root of everything that's wrong with you. Yes, Which but you, I've cherished that all of my life. You've cherished that all your life. You know what you know this. You know what this gentleman's saying. You ha it's the thing, it's the earthy self. It's the ego earthy self, and that's the root of the enmity between man and God. See the ego animal, earthy self that's connected to with all its senses into the world and derives its existence thereby. And here I am teaching you to not react, and I'm cutting you. I'm cutting this ego self off from its nutrients. Why don't I want to give this up? Is it, is it not you? It isn't you. It's the not you that thinks. Stand, stand back and you know that, that, that your thinking isn't yours. It's insane. It doesn't make sense. No, it's you know, like, you have a part that, of you that, that says, this thinking is not yours and it doesn't make sense. Don't give in to it. Because you saw what happened for the 10 years of hell that you did. Yeah. You sure. listened to the wrong side of you. Don't make the same mistake again. Believe me, I know that women 
a lot of women would like to be finished with the sex mess, messy business. It's with their periods and the sex and we, you know, they love to be finished with it. You know, it's the trouble is when they finish with it, they have no relationship with men anymore. No men that want anything to do with them, and they're sitting there lonely on a, in an island somewhere. But cheer up, ladies. There's you know, there's plenty of people <laughs> like you out there. Go go on to better things. You, you know, you've got to go, tra go through it and transcend it and beyond it. And then beyond it, you'll find other people who think like you do. There's better things beyond that. But you've got to get beyond sex if you're going to get beyond... I'm not saying you should give it up right away. You couldn't do it if you tried. But you, only by improving your relationship with God and cutting off your sensitivity, emotional sensitivity to life and learning that's not where life really is. Only the ego life is there, but that ego life is in conflict with the spiritual life, don't you see? So it's up to you, you know, when you've had enough and you've learned enough and seen where it leads, you'll be ready. And I think you're close to that now, yes. Okay, well, we have one minute to wrap this section up and uh, suggest you write to the Foundation of Human Understanding. The Adam and Eve Syndrome is available if you want to read more about this, if you're not too mad with me, like this gentleman is. <laughs> There's a part of you that is mad with me and the part of me that's, part of you says, that man makes sense. But uh, which part will you listen to? That's the, the egotistical part or the... <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, we've got 30 seconds to say goodbye. Please uh, write to the Foundation and support us. We're a you know, non-profit tax-exempt organization and we use all this money to pay for this program. We're only paying for half of it for the last six months, so I don't know what we're going to do, but I'm hanging in there. Thank you for very much and support the program. And I'm hoping that we can shed a little light on this subject. And we've been sort of doing rather well. It's beginning to gather momentum. And uh, so here's this, this lady here wants to start off this, the evening, right? In one of the other sessions, you were talking about how perhaps proper roles between a man and a woman are more where the man is taking the role of father to a woman and that she is more a daughter to him and that he is more uh, do you agree in, with that? in a position of guiding. Do you agree I, with it? Yes, personally I do, that it should, it should be him guiding more. It's, in other words, it's either the woman is going to be the mother of this little boy or the man is going to be the father of, the, of this little girl. And a, a little, I think a woman wants to be a little girl, don't you ladies? Yeah. Don't you feel secure? But the trouble is this, this uh, it, it gets, something gets in the way and spoils it. My question, though, has to do with the role of lovemaking in that kind of a relationship. I couldn't imagine making love to my father, obviously, and that's, that's not right. It's exactly what you're doing, though. How can that be you, right? I'm saying if the man is making love to his mother, the woman is making love to her father. No, but if in a father-daughter a father -daughter relationship, we're, we're talking about a proper relationship. But yeah, but we're talking about there's, there's hardly such a thing as a, a, a proper... You have to be so mature to know what a, what, a, what a proper relationship is. Let's talk about Adam and Eve again and then see how it relates to man and woman in this thing. Um, I base all the things I say on the fact that this mythical Adam and Eve wasn't mythical at all because you can see the same relationship between man and woman, uh, father and daughter, or mother and son, whichever way you want to look at it, repeating itself endlessly in the human race, creating all the misery and suffering that there can be. That the man is always looking for the mother and to nurture himself from the mother he's always known. That's the, that's the origin of his, of his creation, as he knows himself, and he has to know women more to know himself more. See? But the woman is the most desolate because she can never get satisfaction, while the man can. That's why marriages are usually... Marriages, men, men enjoy the sex more than women do. And if they pretend, they're liars. And they have to pretend to have a relationship, if you know what I mean. It's because, you see, because the man is, uses the woman to anesthetize himself. So therefore, he's not, he doesn't know what the woman wants. He only cares about himself. And in that relationship, you know, that it's, it, he's complete unto himself. So, um, if you take the Adam and Eve s syndrome, you see that, that the man, which was the father of the woman, in a sense, he's the father image, is represented by 
your own father. Technically speaking, you tend to love, to be drawn to the kind of man that you hated in your father because it sexually awakens you, because it's the only life you know and the only love you'll ever get through that. You have to be awakened to receive that and you must be compatible with his beast, and so therefore you have to hate him to be female. You have to hate to be female. If you gave up hate, you wouldn't be female, you'd be a woman. And if you're a woman, you turn men off. If you don't hate men, you can't love them. They're both the same. Does that make sense to you? You were asking that question before. Does that, does it, were you following that carefully? Exactly. The average nincompoop out there couldn't understand a word I said. It's, you know, I've seen a glimpse of that. I was mentioning uh, before that uh, when my husband's affectionate, there are times when I've been real objective and it's like he's cut off. And I was thinking as you were talking, you, know, you talk about this stuff that comes up through the woman. Well, it must be coming from somewhere because if I stop, he just automatically stops. He just has, it's almost like he has no connection to that emotion. It's just like he, it's like he deflates him. You know, like well, it is, it is very simple. The moment the man finds his objective state, which means he gets his life from the, the God spirit within, he becomes the father quality through being aware. He immediately sees that he's using this woman and that, that somehow the woman is, has control over him and that this is wrong. He also sees that after having relationship with this woman, encouraging her and sort of, uh, sort of cultivating her out of season need for him, you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. That after that, she's bitchy. Mm -hmm. So anytime you gentlemen find that your wife is bitchy afterwards, you know that you've been promoting her for your own gratification and that you brought out a dark side of her which wants to hurt you and kill you, but yet will make love with you because it's the only life she has. It's, see, in other words, part of her needs to hate you because she's desolate. Remember, hate has made her separate from God. She, when, you hated, when you hated your father, because you, that hate separated you so you could have no life of your own. But it awakened the sexual center and it made you compatible with loving the beast. Because the only, the, in other words, you have to hate to be sexually acceptable to a man to have the kind of loving that comes out of you because only by being open to his sexual need and apparently loving, see, to, 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 can you receive him and to receive any life at all, but it's only a substitute life. You're taking it out of his guts. It's like, for instance, his own, the, the drug, drug addict and the drug pusher are compatible with one another. The drug addict has a need and it cries out to the pusher and they're compatible and he rises to the occasion of that need. His whole life is dependent on taking the life from the pusher, from the, from the drug addict. The pusher depends upon the drug addict, drug addict, life, money, support. So that when a woman is destitute and hating her father has made her destitute, it separated, from her, separated her from her perfect self, non-sexual perfect self. Then at the same time, the sensuous was, nature is opened outwardly as she's closed inwardly. See? And now the relationship, the only life she can have is out of the love of that man, the sexual love of that man. So every woman has, who has hate for her father, gravitated naturally, is attracted towards the, a man in her life who is exactly like her father. Because, because the only life she has is from the downfall of the man she loves. And when the downfall of the man she loves comes, as he, as, he, as he comes into her, see, she receives a false life, a false fulfillment, a false security, a horrible power. And then she looks at this man with contempt like she did with her father, and the whole thing starts all over again. The more she hates him, the more she loves him. They're one and the same. There is no difference between hate and love on this level. It's a trap. Who understands that? And you, you have to go through it. And you have to, no, not only that, but you have to be willing to see it for what it is. Now, if you're a child of the darkness, you will, you'll probably will be writing to the station to get me off. It's a free country, so knock it off. What I'm trying to say is, you have to learn to give up in, images. You have to learn to stop playing with the images in your mind, because the more you play with the image, the more, the more corrupt you'll become. The more corrupt you become, the more 
variations of images there are in your mind until images and sounds and meanings begin to control you completely. You're simply controlled like a robot by all the things around you. Yes? Um, a while ago I heard you say something that might be pertinent to what you're talking about now and it was in relation to eating and thinking of Christ. And I can't remember what you said. And I'm wondering if you need, rather than needing to have an image, if when you're making love or if you're eating or if you're consuming in any way, that you think of Christ. Okay, remind me if I come, get away from that to come back to it, will you please? But the first commandment says you shall not make any graven image. You shall not, neither shall you, you shall not make an image out of anything. Neither shall you bow down to it and worship it. Now ask you, have you all fulfilled that first commandment? You do have images, don't you? And I tell you that there's something that operates on the other side of that image. And there's something that gets into you through your image worship and your image making and your indulgence in, in those images. Your fantasies, in other words. God cannot operate through an image. You must not even have a statue. There must not be, that's why, that's why I'm, I'm sorry to say the Catholic Church is very guilty of violating that commandment, because that is a commandment. You see statues everywhere. You must not, under no conditions, must you have an image of God, of Christ. Cannot come through that. You cannot venerate any image. Any f he operates where there's no image. And as long as you have an image in your mind, and as long as you play with images in your mind, only your ego, what it does, it closes the image of God so it can never get into you and express itself openly. But it closes it down and opens you up to the spirit that, that, that teaches you to violate that, law, that commandment, to have an image and to lose yourself in it and to venerate it and to worship it, to feel alive. Because the first image, of, the first image a man has is the woman. Even a blind man gets turned on, knows what a woman is, even though he's never seen a woman in his life. I've talked to blind men, they've never seen a woman, but they know what one looks like. And in their mind, they can imagine it because it's so deeply rooted is the sin. See? Somehow they've managed to find that form. Because it's, it's, it's practically spiritually genetic. It's original sin. It's man born of woman. Somehow he knows what, it, what to return to. Yeah, and right now, back to your question. Okay, it's it was foggy in my question. It was just something that No, you but you see, what do we do when we want to comfort ourselves? And now, let's look at original sin. You brought it up. Let's go back to the, the scene and let's try to imagine what the original Paradise Lost scene was all about. Woman. Man, in his mind, was told, in his conscience, he knew not to eat of anything. Uh, or he could eat anything he wanted except the fruit that gave him ego life. I'm just putting it in little different words. Is that right or not? One that, and it, it was, but that was the most exciting to him because he wanted to be God and that was the thought that it could, he could be a god. But it also separated, you have to be separate from God to be God. Is that correct? And that was the means by, by separate. So the fruit, whatever it was, is something that you partake of. And whatever it is whereby sin comes, arises, the inner mind is closed because it, the inner self is closed and the, the outer eye is opened. And the, f the first thing you see, of course, is this fruit. You take one bite into it and what do you got in your hand? You've got this food, the forbidden fruit. Have you noticed all food, we like what isn't good for us. <laughs> That's number one. And what, do you do, what, do you, what happens to you when you're lonely? What do men think of, what would a sailor think of if he was on a tiny little island. Food and women. See? 
Because in that scene, in that scene, where, where, man, fell, where, where man fell, when his inner eye was closed and his outer eye was open, he was impressed by everything that was in his environment. And that's the important thing. You're not just only impressed by the woman, but you're impressed, you're also traumatized by the food. And now, you're, now, there's two ways to deal with this. In your mind, in your fallen state, the, the sin of pride has entered. And how, now what is the sin? What came by sin needs sin to sustain it. To, to understand that, that's the nature of trauma. If a person is violated sexually, before the trauma, sexuality and rape and violence might, would have been a, an abhorrent thing. But, in many cases, the violation, the shock, is the way she has overreacted and reacted to it, has altered her, in the, in, in her in, right in the core. So it closed the way a ma she could grow from, as a woman from within. But now she is, she is impressed by the image. And, and, th and, and the, 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 the experience, the kind of man, the way he was dressed, the, the, the rainy night, the color of the car, the kind of the car it was, was cold or hot. Everything of the, in that moment was impressed on her. And now rain affects her. A certain kind of person, a look, affects her. Beards affect her. Colors affect her. And strangely, she finds herself being attracted to objects with those colors. And somehow dreaming of those things, of those kind of men, of that kind of... Aren't you sitting alone on the desert island, you see? You start to think of the thing, the very things that have violated you are now food to you. The thing that was your enemy is now your friend. What has violated you is now needed to sustain you. But, and, and so therefore you know what it is. You come back like a homing salmon. To the, and if you can't have them, if you can't experience their presence through which sin entered and now sin is sustained, if you can't have that, you play with it in your mind, images in your mind. You think of delicious meals. You think of sexual romances and fantasy. And strangely, you get the same effect. But each time you do that, your tendency to respond to images, your sensitivity to the external forms and internal forms is strengthened. You become extremely sensitive to images and being lost in them and in their veneration for some kind of salvation as a means of escaping the guilt of what you've come, what you've become through them. So in other words, you have to worship in the church with, with Mother Mary. You feel it's like it's your salvation, but it's your damnation. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, if you're Catholics, I don't mean to offend you. But you see, some, some, some Catholics are fanatical, aren't they? They almost make the image come alive and talks to them. It, the, into the image and the spirit of the image comes into them and makes them alive. Some, some of the uh, alcoholics talk to their bottles. They get turned on by a cigarette. You see someone smoking a cigarette. And then you think of it, it turns you on, it opens your senses. Because it, it takes that to open your senses, to close the sense, that, to get rid of guilt. When, when you think of an image, it awakens the senses. It means you're reaching toward that, away from truth to maintain your ego, sustain your ego through indulging the image. So ladies and gentlemen, I beg you, I'm sorry I was a little long-winded, but you've got to be very careful of those images. And only to the degree that you can give up the images, you start with that first, savoring the images in your mind no matter what it is. Will you overcome your sensitivity to the real thing? Because what happens is, the images lead to the experience, and the experience reinforce the images, the power of them. And the images indulged lead to the experience, and the experience reinforce images. Until just images scare you, authority. See, anything scares you. It has a tremendous effect on you and controls you. And God doesn't. Yes.
This is a very simple question. But I, I was going to ask her question. I, I, I ask you to come. Let me come back to your question. Oh, okay. f f before you, before I, b do you know that what I'm saying now, I'm leading to something. I had said hold Christ in your mind, and I think what you're saying is hold nothing, don't hold anything right. in your mind. Right. No, don't eat, because, see, because if, if you, here's a whole, the original sin was, came through woman and food. And we were all addicted to women and food. Even women are addicted to women and food. Because you even marry a woman and your husband. <laughs> See? And, uh, but Christ was, was brilliant because he understood one thing. He says, eat this, remembering me. Now, well, because the reason what, what man did, we, he ate food forgetting. He ate food to forget. So if you eat food, remember, but you can't remember him because you don't know where he is, you don't know what he's like. You're just going to have another image. All you have to do is when you eat, when you eat your food, make sure, when you eat your food, just be aware of what you're eating. When you're having sex, don't, don't have any animal images in your mind, don't play little games, don't imagine the, your wife is Marilyn Monroe or something. Or, see? Some people even imagine their husbands as their mothers or something, you know. See? And they imagine themselves as men because they're so sexually exchanged. Don't play with images. Because it's the only way they get turned on otherwise. Because they're more masculine than feminine and their husbands are more feminine than masculine. So in order to get that pleasure and that opening and that feeling and that involvement which re ego requires for its evolution and uh, maintenance, they have to play with images like that, see? It's, the, it's, a, it's, the forbidden, it's like the forbidden fruit. You hanker after it and you reach towards it and you go away from God and you come into the image and the image comes into you and it, that's what you are. It's, uh, that's what, what you're made of, the spirit of the image. And you know what's going to happen to those images after a while? After a while, the images, listen to this, if you don't believe what I'm saying, you can read it in my new book, um, Falling from Love. It's not new, it's an old one. I wrote it years ago. What happens is when you play with images enough, you know that you're into the woman and the woman's into you and you're playing with these and reinforcing the self that is of image, right? And through image. Because everybody, every ego has closed itself in some kind of image. We have an image of ourselves. We, we hope it doesn't break down, otherwise we have to face the awful truth. What happens is that if you do that enough, the evolution of the self that is of image goes one step further. It's like, a, it's like a seed within a seed or a dream within a dream. As you go through, as you go through those levels and go through those levels of developing this image, then you come to the, that which is, has, you come to that experience, that spirit world. Remember you have this sensuous image of self, but there's a spirit that has been, that is within the image. It's like the serpent within, the, within Eve. You know what I mean? There's a spirit in the woman. So when you're playing with a woman, the spirit of the woman gets into you. See? And now the image of the woman is what you come back to in order to reinforce who you are. But there's also something beyond that image which is working its way, encouraging that to work its way into you. And one of these days, and this is where it's scary, one of these days you wake up and suddenly you see horrible faces. You're looking at yourself in the mirror and you see like the picture of Dorian, isn't there somebody else looking back at you? All of a sudden the image gives way to what it really is behind it. Ugliness, evil. You've arrived. It's like the alien. Mm -hmm. And you start to be obsessed and possessed and things talk to you. And it is, is you. And you can see, and that's why people drink. That's why people take pot. That's why people do all... They try to keep from seeing this which is within them, which has come within them because of the playing with the images and the image use. It's heavy stuff. And I didn't mean to give a long, long lecture. But I, I tell you that sitting down and meditating and separating from images, that is where it begins. 
because it means your willingness, you see, to find the truth and not hide in images, not hide, not escape into, from, from what you might be into what you think you can be, which you can never be, the impossible dream, you know, to dream the impossible dream. We, standing back from those images is like becoming naked. It's, it's taking the power of hell away because it can only operate when it invites you into the image. And then it gets into you. And then all this day, one day, you see that it is you. The image falls away, and there it stands in all its horrible glory, a self within the self that was never meant to be. A lot of silence here this evening. Right? Anybody know what I'm talking about? That's when you need exorcisms. That's when you need a psychiatrist but they won't do you any good because they don't understand the process. The process is sin. And you escape from reality through images. First, first of all, they're external. They're objects that you, that you use and become involved with. But when you do, your inner eye is closed. Your outer senses are open. And the first thing you see, you take to be your mother. And it keeps on mothering you and mothering you and mothering you to become so sensitive to it until there's nothing more, nothing but it, and, not, and no truth. And you're dead. The truth dies in you. Is it making sense? Because they do not know how to love God first. They do not know how to love their children. Okay, be in our audience, if you can stand this pace. If you haven't turned off your television by now, you, um, prob you're probably one of us. The, the meditation that we're teaching teaches you to stand back from images because only when you stand back, you know, divest yourself from images, that's when the light of God shines through and you become newly imprinted. It's called salvation. And the new self starts to grow as you reject images and play. You, you start to close your sensuous appetite. It's therefore you cut off that which is supplying your ego in its rebellion against God. See? Very simple. It's like a dying, and can be unpleasant and pleasant at the same time. Thank you very much for paying attention to what I have to say, and uh, if it's not too heavy for you, join us next week. I was um, relating to what you were saying about love, and uh, for a long time, since I was very young, I've uh, I kind of lost the love of my father. How many have ever had love of a father? Well, you see, the thing is that uh, there was something that was going on. You know, like, you know, when you're little, you might say, you know, ooh, look, got good big muscles, you know, and you, you have this kind of bond with your father, and I, I think it's more that maybe I lost the respect of him through something that he was doing. How many people here had any respect for their father anyway? If you, you wouldn't be here if you had respect for your father, to tell you the truth. I'm sorry to say that, but you wouldn't be searching. If you had a father that you really loved, who was truly lovable, who loved you in this dispassionate way, and always guided you to love, not with love. That is the greatest love of all. You guide a person to love, which is not the emotional involvement with the, per the lover. You, the, where, where is love? The love my, my love is, I'm caught up in me, my God. I'm infilled. He is in me and I am in Him. And nobody can get in the way. Now, I love now. I'm, my bond, I've, I'm internally bonded and complete. I need nobody for my completion. I need you to support the foundation, but I don't need you for my completion as a whole person. Don't you see that? Isn't that what you like about me? I don't prey on you. I, you don't find any pressure at the foundation, do you? You want to give something, you give it out of the goodness of your heart. That's sweet for you too, isn't it? And it's sweet for me. If, if you give because you give, it's not because I've motivated you or because, because you're addicted to my approval, like some churches. See? I haven't, I haven't pumped you up and made you miss me when the pump isn't there. See? It's because I'm, I love you not because of the mushy love that is feminine. Ladies, forgive me for saying that. I don't mean that's important for little children, that warmth and love for children. But 
mother, fathers have to save children from that. <laughs> you see? But first of all, they have to save themselves from that. I have to let my sons go through their, that earth love first. They have to have a woman. You see? I've got to guide them to make sure they've got one that's not too strong for them. You see? There's certain, certain rules and regulations about making sure that you, you know, that you're the master of the situation even though she's got you to some degree. <laughs> that you still have that sort of strength in you to eventually pull out of it and beyond it so that you can be a kind of father that you need to be with your children. Am I, uh, did, I, did I get away from the subject a little bit? Well, sort of. Um, you see, my father had a, a perversion. A perversion? Yes. Um, to the to the female form and uh, well, all men, all that's that's why you can't. That's why oh, women yeah, can't but, respect men yeah, and, and children can't. He did something can't. to my sister. Pardon? He did something to my sister. Shocking. I know. And uh, well, then how could you love him? I know, but it, 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 there's something that I just got to deal with with that. I know, but what you're saying is you. I don't know what it is. It, it, whatever love you have can't be, unless you're a very noble being and transcended. But ordinary love means, the kind of thing that he did to his sister and the kind of thing that men do that to their women. Mm -hmm. Unless you transcended it, then you can love, uh, for instance, you know, I can love my wife, but I, I love her not like men love women. See, not anymore. I don't love her like men. I love her like a father loves a daughter. I correct her, and believe me, she needs it. <laughs> if I treated her any other way, she, uh, I, I would, I, I would it wouldn't exist. But women ultimately need that anyway. That, the Adam and Eve, you know, when Adam, if you read the scripture, you'll read that you know, Adam was, was perfect. He was created to be imperishable, self-contained. So was Eve. And a matter, as a matter of fact, uh, um, it is this relationship with the father, Adam's relationship with the father, which is it's called wholeness and completeness. But the, the, woman's, the, man, the, the woman was out of man. Technically, she was his clone. And in scientific language, we know what cloning is. It's a non-sexual reproduction. So in a matter of sense, what the book is saying is that Eve was a clone, a reflection of man. See, and she was technically not his wife, but his, his child. But when the fall of man came, and man fell away from the spiritual father, from his wholeness, and the spirit of the woman displaced that, then she, he became her child. See? And ever since that time, women mother the egos of men, sexually, because that, get, that, that pops up, you see, if you pardon the way I said that. See? Because the, the, the fall of man is, is, is his dying, and he becomes then a, a creature that perpetuates, perpetuates itself Instead of being imperishable, everlasting to everlasting, perfectly re self-renewing, because the God is the God is the self that renews. You follow that? So that when man falls from that and dis has become displaced by the spirit of the woman he failed to love, like a daughter. Now he becomes he becomes now her child. And you see, to this very day that men mother women. But very rarely have you ever seen a, a man father a woman. Every woman is looking for the father that she's never known. But every man is gravitates to the, to the woman he's always known. You see that? It's, in other words, he's imprinted with a woman and he's drawn back to the woman just like his mother. So his wife, which then becomes his wife, having had a woman that mothered him, and kept him from God to be a male child. He's actually a man's having sex with his mother when he's having sex with his wife. That's all there is to it. A, wo a, ma a woman literally sexually mothers maternally. It's almost a maternal thing for a woman to have sex with a man, and a man, I and, and the man, while he's involving himself sexually with his, this mother, is actually being his ego, the the, the the, the child of this woman is being nurtured. The spiritual part of him is being nurtured. While the, but, do you understand what I'm trying to say? It's hard to say it. See, in other words, the sexual impulse of the woman 
because of the man falling from, from the perfection, out, out comes the, the evidence of his failing with, se with his sexuality. So now, man is now a male. And, and the mother of this creature is the woman who has teased him and brought this out of him and created this need for her to nurture. But she nurtures it. She rises to the occasion of nurturing this pain that he has, this tension, this lust, which is connected psychically. It's an ego-testicle quality. It's, they're connected, you see. She nurtures that, and as she has sex with him, she's actually nurturing the ego through the sexual experience. She's actually mothering this, this creature into existence like she was God. So he gets his wholeness, his internal wholeness from this experience. Does the ladies know that? Yes? Um, is it the, the spirit of woman now that, that nurtures a child with, with love? It's and the they same love. They, they the appeal same. To, the, to the emotion, you know, of the child. Right. And then they use it against the child later on in years. Yes. Right? And see, everybody that's uses it against everybody in life. That's exactly right. It's transferred, you see, this emotional bond. That's why I'm saying the bond of man should be eventually to his creator. But the, the, but the womanizer, the presence of a woman the day a child is born, when a woman holds that child to her bosom and loves this child, what she's doing, if especially it's a male child, she's just, she's just by this warmth and this supportiveness, is nurturing the, uh, the brainchild of her, Im of her own image. M man made over in the image of a female spirit. See? And and of course, man has already experienced some of this in relationship to his woman anyway, for which reason he has already trouble with her. Had to begin to make demands, controlling. He feels the bond, the emotional connection to his brain, to which his ego is attached. But, but his ego cannot grow without that emotional reinforcement, can it? See, which means more bonding to the woman and more ability for her to make demands on him. So pretty soon he becomes impotent in being able to correct her because he's not out of God, he's out of the woman. You can't stand up to God when it's the woman, you see? So, um, so now the, ch the woman has the same relationship with her children because man, having used her for his own ego building and having degenerated like an addict in need, is now impotent to correct that situation because he's not from God, he's out of woman. And what is out of a woman can't correct a woman. But what is in a woman needs that correction and she longs for a man to be a man and not need her. And what part of her longs for the man to need her because her own power structure is based on it. It's a false security, but that's the only security she has. She would be better off with the security of having a man who didn't need her, see? Who, who could guide her back to being not a parasite, but a whole person from within herself. The trouble is men have pressured men, women, to play this role. Being corrected, as I see it in life today, they resist it horribly. Uh, it's no, it's not the woman. It's not the woman that wants to be that doesn't want to be corrected. Not all women want to be. No, no, you understand. Oh, that's better. No, no, no. It's not the woman. It's not the woman that doesn't want to be corrected. It's what the woman is held captive by. You see, don't you understand? You have a spirit in the garden, paradise. There was something in the garden we call the serpent. See, it's a, it's a, it's a nature that got into the woman that got into the man. So not only can a man not correct a woman, but um, he doesn't want to because he, his ego, which came from it, needs that woman to be that way. It's very difficult for a man. Besides, there are women that do want to be corrected. They don't like their own power. They don't like being the mother of this man and turning him into whatever it is, a beast or a wimp. They know that, they sense that, but they can't tell anybody. They can't tell the man. They can't make, it, make him into the kind of man that, that, that they need to save her. They don't know how to do that. So they have terrible frustration. But they really want a man to be not to need. Well, we're going to continue on with this thought um, tomorrow, in, in our next segment. It will be tomorrow night for the viewers. You'll find all this information in the Adam and Eve syndrome. And uh, it's $10 if you're interested. And there's a new book coming out soon called Falling from Love, with the in crossed out, fr Falling from Love. It's really an old book, but we just uh, put some more chapters with it and revised it. But w what we have to do is remedy the falling part and try to unite you back to your original selves. 
you know, the woman with herself and man with himself, which is the same God. And to that end, please take note of the uh, little commercial at the end of our program and write to us and we'll be happy to supply these tapes and cassettes and books to serve that purpose. Thanks for listening and supporting the program.